Little ones, I have another story to tell. Or maybe I should say, a story to continue. Now you all recall those three dangerous women I was telling you about last time. That foul-mouthed, hard-drinking, sin-loving girl rights what? Who was wanted by the law for truth and too much and being uncharitable to the ladies. Bad News Hannah, who'd been a burr under the saddle at any newspaper man who'd played fast and loose with the facts until they'd finally sicked the marshals after her. And that poor moon addled lunatic Allison, who claimed to be a badger of all things, from Badger Town, of all places, and who preached a set of laws that no sane man or woman could even wrap their heads around. Now, whatever forces brought us to this moment, meet those three women dead at a crossroads on a night with no wind and no moon, a night when even the crickets weren't talking. The three of them stopped in their tracks and eyed each other. The only sound was the restless shifting hooves of Hannah's ill-tempered mule. Some seemed to pass between the three women in that moment. As one, they looked toward us, to where the faint lights of our peaceful, unsuspecting little town kissed the tips of the grass on that very hilltop. Hannah smiled. Allison's face went perfectly still. And the girl writes what? She laughed out loud, took a swig of her moonshine, and said, Y'all got business with that town? Hannah offered her a curt nod. Allison, always polite, inclined her head, fingers brushing the iron at her side. Karen bit the end of her cheroot and grinned. Well, what are we waiting for? And what happened next? What would become of this here sleepy, quiet little town, which the good Lord named you two? Oh, we shall see, my darlings. We shall see. Welcome to Honey Badger Radio Classic number one. This is your host, the moon-addled lunatic, Allison Tiemann. And with me for this installment of HBR Classic and every installment hereafter is Karen Strawn, otherwise known as Girl Writes What? and Hannah Wallen. We've decided to get back to the original format that launched Honey Badger Radio once every two weeks, just the three of us. And for the faint of heart, a warning. All three of us are old school brawlers, so expect some shouting. Maybe a little bit of fisticuffs, but we've all checked our iron at the door, so hopefully no fatalities. Now let's get on with it. This morning on Honey Badger Radio, I uploaded a video in which I made a diagnosis about what's happening in society. And this is what I see. And to those of you who keep saying I'm aligning social media, I'm observing what happens when a large portion of human beings are exposed to the online world in which the creation of radically homogenous social enclaves is possible. And what I'm seeing is that society is stratifying into layers. The densest and lowest layer are people who are addicted to a purified social consensus, to being part of a large group of people online who think exactly as they do with no deviations. These online Puritan enclaves tend to form in cities from people with very little real life ballast. For example, weak ties to family and community and are is isolated in dense population centers. Their social outlet, their main way of generating belonging is being part of these communities with a highly purified social consensus. Now, social consensus is addictive. It's addictive to feel enclosed within the arms of a multitude that agrees with everything you say. It is a rush, and even more of a rush than feeling social consensus is ejecting someone from your social consensus. Above that dense lower layer of super Puritans is a second layer comprised of people slightly more resistant to being addicted to a purified social consensus. These individuals can maintain some level of awareness and acceptance of points of view different than their own, and they may have stronger ties to their family, churches, community organizations, whatever. However, they are not immune to addiction to purified social consensus. 
When the lower layer is exposed to a reality it rejects, such as the election of a president <laughs> that they insist is illegitimate, the pressure of that reality which surrounds them will, and which will eventually be framed as oppression will cause that layer to become denser, reaching critical mass and starting to heat. Calls for censorship, protests, riots, and violence will be coming fast and furious. In response to this new pressure being placed on it by extremely dense layer below, the second layer above will start to condense and heat itself, becoming violent and authoritarian in response to the first layer's chaos and aggression. The second layer's response will only be in reaction to the first threat by the threat posed by the denser layer below, but the result will be the same. Weaponized Puritanism and two out of control intolerant of dissent groups fighting over the narrative. Like two poles of a magnet in a magneto, the opposition to the opposition to groups will end up driving a conflict that has the potential of destroying society as we know it. Now, what do we do to stop it? Okay. Hello, am I joined um, by anyone? Go ahead, Karen. Okay, so okay, what do we do to stop it? I don't fucking know. Oh, well, actually, you know what? You, you can take issue with anything that I've I've said as well. If you wish to yeah. bring in other other points of view, if you wish to say I'm full of shit, go ahead. No, I do, I do, I do think that you make a good point in in terms of you know particularly in urban centers, particularly when uh, uh, family has sort of um, taken a little bit of a a hit, and not even in terms of you know family breakup and stuff like that, but I mean you look at my extended family uh, at one time for about fifteen years one sister and her husband and kids were in Halifax and then in Ottawa living. My parents and my other sister and her kids were here in Edmonton and I was way the fuck on the north tip of Vancouver Island and it's very, very difficult to um, maintain um, sort of just the regularness, the ordinariness of, of being, of, of those kinship bonds um, when you're that far apart and I think that that's, uh, that's a really good observation. I think that the social isolation of being in cities. Um, I would also suggest that uh, I was talking with someone, uh, I think I had a four hour phone conversation with him one day. He called me out of the blue, wanted to thank me. And uh, because my phone number is not hard to find. And, um, but he was uh, Bangladeshi and he was a foreign student here in Canada. And he said one thing that he's noticed is that in Bangladesh, um, the, the communities have to rely on each other, right? So, you know, one family is struggling, they'll be bringing, uh, their neighbors will be bringing, um, you know, a bag of carrots or something over to their house, right? I mean, they will help feed each other. They'll help their, you know, the, the community's elderly. They'll do all of these things together because they have to, nobody else is going to do it for them. But with, uh, a, society like ours, um, where, I mean, really very few people are starving, um, and it's generally not for want of actual money. It's, it's generally due to uh, issues of dysfunction that they have themselves, and because there's, there's, there's money available to them to survive. You find that you're not relying on community anymore, and as if you're not relying on community, then there's no point getting to know your neighbors. And so, essentially, you have this situation where, even in in uh, small towns, often you'll you'll see way less interaction between individuals in those towns than than you would have maybe 50 years ago. So, what? What gets me about when you're stuck in a community, right, is, is you have to deal with people who annoy you. You have to learn how to get along with your neighbor who votes the, the, the way opposite that you do. Um, you have to be able to figure out how to get along, and you're exposed to the viewpoints of all of the people who live around you. You're not, you don't see that much anymore. So... Yeah, when people actually have to turn to online communities, and especially if they're politically minded, when they turn to online communities, it really is easy for not just um, a clubhouse, you know, the local chapter of, say, the KKK being able to, you know, attract locals, 
it, it is much more um, able to reach out across large distances and, and pull people in. And then they don't have to exist alongside that neighbor who is a thorn in their side or that person that they disagree with across the street. Because there is no person like that across the street. You just hit the block button and they're gone. So I think that, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of the dangers of social media are exactly what you said, but I think that there was some groundwork laid um, sort of over the last 50, 60, 70 years that, that's really um, laid the foundation for how dangerous it actually is, how problematic social media can be. It wouldn't be a as much of a problem if we didn't have this broader trend towards social isolation that's been happening since suburbanization and and all of this other stuff. So, yeah. But well, as for solutions, I don't fucking know. Okay, well, I'd, I'll just go slip in there and add to uh, what you're saying, Karen. Um, when you have a community that needs to rely on its uh, on each other for for survival. Um, you, you, you form those bonds regardless of, of uh, attitudes. And you also, I think it, those kinds of communities sort of restrict how much po people end up believing in these, um, these overall arcing solutions for society's problems. Because your immediate problems are, are more pressing. And this is something I've even noticed, and you're right, it has been reduced in the last 50 years, but this is something I've even noticed in w living in a small town. The politics is very, very local. So there's not a lot of ideology going on. It's mostly the politics are, you know, uh, paying for the hospital. Um, are, are we gonna Are we gonna start doing something with the water so it doesn't rot or plumbing? You know, it's, stuff like that becomes very much more present in people's minds, and much, it's much more practical politics. Who's fixing the fucking potholes? Jesus. Yeah, exactly. And and, and should we fix the potholes, or is, or is it? You know, or, or do the potholes serve to slow traffic down? And, and who wants an ostentatious speed bump? I mean, really, <laughs> we're, we're not like those that that other town over there that just you know hot hoity toity you know, speed bump slowing. The, you know, we we'll keep with the we'll keep with the honest and God given pothole to keep traffic slowing. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's that, it's that those kinds of arguments that really I think um, characterize small town life. And it like I said, it's very local politics. And because people are much closer together and closer to surviving uh, or needing each other to survive, I think um, I think it's uh, it, 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 it does create sort of a difference between the rural and you can even see the rural uh, urban split in the in the recent election. OK, Hannah, go ahead. Well, th there's what you're talking about happens in small towns, but it's not. Um, my experience with small town politics is, is, is a little different. And it, it happened because uh, essentially somebody was, a, a, a couple of folks actually were trying to create sort of a boss hog situation where there was, you know, a, a, a network of, I hate to use the term good old boys network because feminists have turned it into an only men thing. And there were women involved, but the main three were a local men. Aristocracy, you mean? Sort of, yeah. Um, and it's like this was a small, small town, you know. I mean, and there were smaller towns around us, but the entire county is small like that. And uh, like we had maybe eight thousand people when I was in high school. And my 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 graduating class had a hundred and sixty some, hundred and seventy kids in it, and we were a big class, you know. Uh, so. That was that was the situation. What the the shortest version I can say is we had we had a, a mayor, a service director, and a, a, a city attorney, um, a law director, that that wanted to and a, and a uh, sergeant, a police sergeant, that sort of wanted to set themselves up as as you know the the bigwigs club in town, and they manipulated the. Um, placement of the new police chief in a way that was illegal. They got the civil service uh, commission into it and everything and it resulted in a huge controversy in our little town and it was it wasn't just you know people arguing back and forth. There weren't street protests, nobody broke the windows downtown or anything but we had police cars sitting outside my house 
for a year watching and and hassling our portrait customers to uh, to see if they pl parked you know too close to the curb and they could ticket them they cut the trees down on the uh, lawn area the right of way between the sidewalk and the uh, the street that provided shade for the house because they could because the city owns that area they they, they designated them um, dangerous trees even though they were not unhealthy and uh, one of the trees was completely gone one of them was severely cut back the part they left after they cut the one tree back they left it really tall and thin so then when a tornado did hit the house it took the top off of that tree and dropped it on the house um, it might have done more or less damage we don't know had that tree been in its original shape but this was done to numerous trees around our, our place. You know, this it was stuff like that was going on. So I mean, there the the political thing, the uh, authority coming down on on people, and we had our, we were vandalized. Um, there was stuff put in my my car engine, sugar at one point, uh, M and M's actually. Somebody dumped a whole bag of M and M's in my gas tank. That we had to get we had our tires slashed we had nails put into uh the tires of our cars we were egged we had our phone line cut um we had calls in the middle of the night from from uh uh from uh numbers that were you know uh you couldn't you couldn't trace them and stuff like that so there was like there was all kinds of shit like that it happens in small towns and that it was it was over the the dividing line was the political party that the people doing this uh, belonged to everyone from that political party was on their side and excused everything they did and everyone from the political party that my mother was in was on the side of the uh, the, the the guy that was basically wrongfully kept out of the police chief position and they used a false accusation of criminal behavior to do that to him so there was a big hearing city council had a hearing and now at one point the community got behind we have to have a hearing about this um and at, and all of the city councilmen that had, that had gone along originally with the this ridiculous behavior uh, got voted out and they got voted out not because they agreed with what was going on but because they rubber stamped it without reading it and that was what their opponents all campaigned on my mom was the only one that year that got reelected um, but once the hearing started and and the various individuals involved began talking about it and everything it was Democrat versus Republican and the party, um, the party of the the mayor, the service director, and you know that that was one side, and the party, the other party was the other side, and it it stayed that way, uh, even after the controversy was over. Uh, it was it was insane. At one point, cops that had been loyal to the old police chief who was wrongfully put into place followed my brother from uh, the middle of a, a line of traffic to his girlfriend's house and then gave him a ticket for a speed he couldn't have been doing because the entire line of traffic was going slower than that. Uh, so this is like all of this, I, this idea that this stuff can't reach small towns and that small towns are immune to this. No, tribalism happens everywhere. Oh, and what it actually takes to get through this is that you have to teach your kids everybody has to teach their kids outside of the school system because the school system's not going to do it uh, you have to teach your friends you have to teach your folks to take critical looks at things to take a, a critical look not just at uh, the other side but their own and, and to take a critical look at what they're being asked to judge, how they're being asked to judge it, and what they're being asked to do as a result. And if, that, if it's something that they would not approve of, 
if there were no politics involved. If it was just a simple uh, discussion of, of this person and that person, and there was no Republican, no Democrat, no Christian, no non-Christian, no atheist, no whatever, just people with none of those details taken in. If you take those details out and they wouldn't approve of the behavior, then you got to get them to question, Would you, why are you accepting it now? And then that, that is hard. And I'm seeing it on Twitter. I'm seeing people uh, push back. Like there's, there's a few people that are, that are followers of mine on Twitter that, that are fans of the show and everything that get really upset when they see the rioting criticized and they see it pointed out that there are manipulative ideologues behind a lot of this rioting and their excuse uh you know for 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 engaging in tribalism ends up being that there are manipulative ideologues behind a lot of the rioting but it's different when they say it and it's it's not a left right thing you know i get the same thing when i criticize attacks on uh, like the, the the past attacks on gay men in the united states where they were killed for for being gay and where it's happening the same you know in other countries and it and it is a religious behavior it is a behavior that's but it's not entirely because uh, there's there's history shows that there's other um, other groups that have done the same thing and other nations that didn't do it because of religion but left-wingers and right-wingers both use there are manipulators behind people doing this um, as as their both their excuse and their attack and what we need to to get to we need to get to a point is when we notice that that's happening that there is some ideologue trying to manipulate the public we need to look past the shit that that person is putting out and and actually look at each other and work with each other that's where we have to go well, I, I just want to add uh, to what Hannah was saying um, in terms of, you know, you got to teach your kids to, to judge, to, to think about stuff. I mean, like my son, he's 14, he's in grade nine. Uh, his, he's got social studies for the full year. Um, and about a month ago, his old social studies teacher left the school, moved away. And he's got a new social studies teacher, and this new social studies teacher is extremely anti-Trump, extremely um, anti-right wing, very, very, you know, inserts politics into everything. So my kid comes home today and says, oh, you know, you know what my teacher told us in social studies is that um, it's Trump's fault that shooting in the mosque in Quebec that Trump's inspiring uh, white nationalist terrorism, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, I'm putting my face in my hands and I'm going, okay, because it couldn't have anything to do with the fact that Quebec is a, already a highly nationalistic province. It is, it is not a Canadian national, it is nationalism, it is a Quebec nationalism. And they're extremely protective of their culture, conserving their culture, such that, you know, they have very, very detailed rules on how big the, the, the English words on signs can be compared to the French ones, right? And we also just, you know, not that long ago, we had an attack on Parliament by a Muslim who shot a soldier dead and then got into the Parliament, parliament building with a bag full of, of guns and almost got into the the chambers, the uh, the 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 House of Commons, the chambers that were was full of MPs, full of all of our federal level politicians. Right before he was shot and killed by uh, the hero of the year, essentially for all of Canada, um, who was an old retired guy who has had a, as a ceremonial position as head of security, a mostly ceremonial position, but he was the guy who saved the day. Um, and we had an, a soldier uh, murdered in, I believe it was Montreal, you know, uh, very, very close to each other, not that long ago, yet again by another Muslim. And 
you know, honestly, a lot of this young man's attitudes towards Muslim and the threat that he thinks it it poses to uh, Quebec society, to Quebec culture, to all of us, you know, that might have been incubating for an awfully long time before Trump came along, right? And Trump, nowhere have I ever seen him condoning violence, ever, 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 ever. So I'll just add to the, the Quebec nationalism thing. One of, uh, there might be some more hostility towards immigrants in Quebec because yeah. immigrants often choose to make English their first language and not French. And there's all kinds of, of politics here that it really are erased when people say that Trump made a white nationalist in Quebec kill a, 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 well, some Muslim men. I, I told, I told my son, six Muslim men. I told my son, Next time you're in class, ask him how Trump caused the, the kidnappings and the murders in the whole FLQ crisis while you're at it. How, how is he responsible for that? Yeah, right. and the thing is that um, this situation, uh, it's it, it, like I said, it was really complicated. When I when I learned about all this and actually looked at this, uh, I think it's Bissonette, his... Uh, um, yeah. his um, Facebook likes. I mean, there's the only thing that was really consistent was a lot of Quebec nationalist stuff, like f Facebook pages. No, that's fine. It's no problem. When I was looking at it, I was like, oh goodness, how are how is the media going to figure out where these this this incident lies on the progressive stack in Canada? Well, man, <laughs> I, I told I told my son, you know, ask your teacher tomorrow how how Trump is responsible for the FLQ crisis. And then I want you to also ask him, or I want you to ask him what his evidence, how does he, how do you know what this guy's motivations were and what inspired him to do it? How do you know that? Because the police have not released that information. What yeah. is your evidence? Because you can't know. For all you know, the guy was pissed off because the mosque was putting on a bake sale and the Arabic was too big on the fucking sign, right? And he said, I can't say that. Everyone in the class agrees with him, and they'll all say, where's your evidence? And I'm like, you don't have to provide any evidence. He's the one making the claim, right? And it just, it, it infuriates me, because even if, even if it turns out that this kid, well, he's not really a kid, but he looks like one, that he was inspired by Donald Trump to do this, even if he comes right out and pulls a Ted Bundy, it was the porn made me did it. Oh, it was the Trump made me did it, okay? Um... Even if that's the case, we don't know at this point exactly what the circumstances were leading up. We don't know how long he's had these feelings. We don't know any of that. That's something that I, I think really needs to be touched on. Um, and I, I don't know if any of you ever have seen the movie Conspiracy Theory. Um, but it's a it's a funny movie and it's a sad movie and there's a little bit of it that can kind of hit home. It, you have Julia throughout one, it, it, huh? Julia Roberts and Mel Gibson. Yeah, all right. And you think about this. There's an aspect of it in reality. Um, not not so much the the government plant thing, but throughout society there are various levels of mental health in people and there's sort of a line you cross where you you get to a point where um your mental health is bad enough to need treatment and then there's another line you cross where your mental health is bad enough to to make you a danger to yourself and others and it's it's okay for uh authorities to interfere to protect you or, or the people around you from the symptoms that you'll exhibit which can include violence and in in that various like in that whole rainbow of variety of mental health you have among them people that you could consider to be not sleeper cells but essentially sleeper human bombs, human time bombs. And I think at, at the higher up level in, in political ideology, the, the folks that, that are, they're not just political ideologues, they're also marketing experts. Now, that layer of the population is very good at manipulation. And they are very good at propaganda. They are very good and figuring out exactly what is going to set off a human time bomb somewhere. And it doesn't necessarily have to be one side or the other. Both sides do it. And both sides blame the other side when it happens. Well, and what and now now there's more. When you have 
somebody go off that is either on, you know on one side or the other of the political fence we frequently blame that person's side of the political fence for their going off but what we're looking at here is a situation where the loudest and most prominent voices are all in the media in television in movies and even online because one side is getting silenced by shadow bans and outright suspensions and bans on social media for being on the wrong side of the political fence we have one side uh, which a, a friend of mine compared it more to a 20 side die um, from for for D and D fans it's and it and it's probably a better uh, perspective because it has at least that many if not more sides but the progressive end of it gets to say the most to the most people and I think those human time bombs going off are are being set off more by progressive propaganda than anything else and yeah. it's very easy to scare the shit out of someone to the point where they think you have pre created such a threat that they have to go off and do something about it that you're bringing in you know dangerous terrorists and and, and this is the same thing I, I'm gonna I'm gonna re refer back to something that happened in the United States last year last year or the year before when the Ebola virus was making the news we had all this news right about how it, it was incurable and it was killing people and it was so dangerous and it was so terrible and then Obama started importing people with the Ebola virus for treatment in the United States and that I think was designed to create a panic you know and this is the same kind of thing we have all this information out about Islamic terrorism and there is yeah. Islamic terrorism and it is a real thing and there are dangerous terrorists coming in with the refugees hiding among the refugees unvetted following the people that are trying to escape them over to the United States over to Canada and other countries and wreaking havoc in their lives and the lives of the original residents of these countries and that's being highly publicized it was only a matter of time before one of the human time bombs went off well and I don't I, really think that was an accident I also I also do want to say you know like when you look at what happened at Berkeley um, last night and uh, it was last night right that um, when when the because they're all there protesting Milo they're protesting Trump they're protesting the alt-right they're protesting Republicans they think that this they are there. They are there on behalf of the left. The I don't think all of them even know what they're protesting, to be, oh, no, to be honest. Of course, they're just protesting because the other side won, and he's a big, scary guy, and someone told me he was a Nazi, and he was going to send all of the the gays to, back to Gayland or something. I don't fucking know, right? They they have no fucking clue half the shit that, that they're talking about, right? But... All they know is those guys are the enemy, right? And we have to silence them, right? And so you, you, and they've been whipped up by this huge media panic over, oh my God, what, you know, Trump is going to be, Trump is going to be the next autocrat. He's going to actually consolidate so much power at the top that he is going, he won't go away when his term's over. He, like, he's not going to hold any Democratic elections anymore. If he does, they're just going to be sham elections like happen in, in freaking China or wherever, right? That, that's what people believe. People are starting to believe that because they have, of course, all of those way, 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 way more voices in left media, left-leaning and progressive media, all having a platform to tell them that, Right, and they don't get any kind of information from either side, and then they're self-selecting any contrary information out of their daily experience uh, voluntarily, just because they don't want to hear it. And so you essentially, and then you essentially have this thing happen at Berkeley, and everybody is blaming Trump. Well, if Trump wasn't such a monster, these people wouldn't have felt the need to do that. And I'm like, okay. That's like if you weren't such a bitch, he wouldn't hit you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, by the way, uh, in, in our in the chat, 
I would like to uh, to to uh, thank uh, Raymond. Oh shit! It just disappeared. Uh, shoot, Raymond for uh, uh, Berserkly. And God, every time I hover over it, it disappears. Fuck you two! Fix Berserkly? your goddamn new uh, your your <sighs> shit. Berserkly. 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 Raymond Berserkly. Duncan for Berserkly. Thank you, Raymond Duncan. That was a great pun. Um, I want to point out, this is this is something that happens with every political outlook. It happens with the uh, anti-religious and religious conflict between, you know, the, the both ends, like where there's people in the middle that are just non-religious or religious that want to just live their lives and be left alone. And then at either end, there's people that object to the other side existing. And, uh, want to outlaw them or or otherwise get rid of of their side of that fence and you know every area where there is uh two sides to a belief and two sides to a to a conflict you have this and it's there's a a, a disconnect at the grassroots level I, I wrote about it with respect to feminism uh, a while back um where i referred to it as sort of the team feminist effect uh, like this is um, here it is the other side the other effect of the disconnect which supports the machine is that at the grassroots level loyalty outweighs logic this is due to the tendency to want more to perceive oneself as right rather than to be right it's a loyalty you see in politics all the time treating an ideology the same way one treats one's favorite university athletic clubs they're not feminists they're supporters of team feminist many of whom don't have any real grasp on the mechanics or method of the game. That is true of every political outlook. Even, even mine, even the libertarian idea, there are people who will advocate the dictionary definition of anarchy in the name of libertarianism, and other people who will go along with it without realizing what that entails, because team libertarian, you know, um, and that's not actually the libertarian outlook, but people will go along with it. And if somebody came into greater influence in the, the libertarian population, because there's not really a community there, um, it, it would become, there would be a grassroots, total anarchy, real, uh, honest to God, lawlessness movement that would, that would do the same things to a degree that we're seeing today you know it could happen with conservatives uh witch hunts you know the, the mccarthy era now it might not necessarily always manifest in overt rioting type violence but there will always be something and yeah jacks l in the chat admitting you're wrong is a sign of maturity and strength but it's the most one of the most difficult signs of maturity and strength to exhibit it's hard to admit you're wrong it's hard to give up a dearly held belief and it's hard to give up a belief that is dearly held by a system to which you're loyal like when i went from being um a supporter of the the of maintaining the death penalty in the United States to being an opponent of government use of the death penalty. That was hard. It was a, a huge amount of, of cognitive dissonance um, that was involved. And uh, like I went, I went through some uh, mentally some rough shit going from one position to the other there because there are people who commit crimes who are that that those crimes are not just reprehensible they're horrifying absolutely nightmarish horrifying things like one of the ones that that i used to use to support the death penalty was a guy that attacked a stranger on the subway and cut his heart out and started to eat it and i'm thinking this guy is always going to be a risk right he is never going to be somebody that will not kill again he's going to be a risk not only outside the prison system if he were to to escape but he'd be a risk to other prisoners there's no safe way to, to house this guy but then i started reading about all of the instances where the death penalty is wrongfully applied 
and and where they go overboard and they start applying it in cases where the person is not a threat t uh, to repeat the crime and the crime hasn't been that horrifying and all the times when it turns out later the person is innocent and all the times when the death penalty is applied and um, the execution is botched and the person being executed suffers extended torture on the way to death and you combine those things and you think about what if an innocent person accused of a terrible crime or a person whose uh, mental condition is not such that they are competent to understand what they did goes through that horrible torture because I was angry that the, there was a guy that cut someone's heart out on, on, on the subway. Did he deserve that? Did the, did the mentally uh, challenged guy deserve that torture because somebody else cut a person's heart out? You know, that's, you go through something, there's a term for that in, um, I don't know if all churches use it, but in, in the Christian Union uh, denomination of, of Christianity, it's called being under conviction when you you realize uh, the gravity of an area in which you were wrong and it, it took me going through that to realize I can't trust my government with the death penalty and I'm not against the death penalty because I think it's wrong to kill in self-defense I'm against the death penalty because I think it's wrong to put it in the hands of an entity that misapplies it so frequently and tortures people to death I have to agree, and that's a real that that whole thing just bummed me right out. But I well, was, the the, I was, the point I, of it is, you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to put yourself under conviction, for lack of a better term. You do, um, but I just wanted to cheer things up. I was just glancing at the Skype one of the Skype chat rooms, and uh, someone yelled out at some point for whatever reason. It caught my eye, Milo Hu Akbar. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And then somebody else said, that's what you say if they're going to die and get 72 black guys in the afterlife. Black, black male virgins? Okay, with, yeah. that, oh with that complete, complete derailing. Yeah, well, it, I, I, was, I was looking to derail with a little humor because... Yeah, but I'm, I was looking to derail to actually rerail it on the, the topic. Um, there you go. Yeah, exactly. It, it all worked out about, about, you know, pretty much as well as it usually does. Um, but yeah, so to get it back on topic, the topic really was about, and I guess we were actually addressing it because part of the solution to this kind of thing is to hold us to hold ourselves to a standard of, of, you know, criticizing our own beliefs and, and doing the work to, to correct them or to, 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 you know, hold them up against reality and see if they, if it works, if it still works. And there was a there was a um, video I watched recently. Who was uh, it? Was a, a games review guy who I do not know the I do not know the remem remember the name of. He was a large man with a bald head, and he was talking about Ashley Judd, and he was also talking about fake news. And he was bemoaning the difficulty of dealing with fake news, and how it's so easy to get taken in and so difficult to actually figure out what isn't fake. And um, recently I talked to Brian and he talked about how, or he talked about a, uh, an image that he had been sent on, on his Facebook that showed a left-wing Facebook feed and a right-wing Facebook feed. And they were completely different, like completely different um, versions of the same events, I believe is what, what it was. Um, and it's, it's interesting how um, people seem to be confounded by fake news and I think that maybe people who are like us or like myself who never really got how to think in terms of social consensus, and I'm not saying that like I'm a better person than anyone else. It, when, when I was presented with, oh, no, we need to think this way or we need to believe this because that is what people believe, just do it. Um, I always felt like that moment where you're falling backwards on the ice and you're in the air and you're like, oh shit, I'm gonna break my back this time. And it's, it always felt like that and it never felt like I could hold on to anything when I was told just to believe something because. And part of that reason is because I need to see the underlying 
substrate of wh what how this 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 pattern is coming out. And I think that's one of the ways that you combat fake news, is you keep your options open, and and you keep your feelers out, and um and you know and you combat in yourself your own narratives that you tell yourself, your own attachments to particular theories. You you cross check it. You check it against reality. You try to falsify it. And I've always like been like that since I was a kid. I was always self questioning and trying to falsify my own thoughts. Um, which sort of led me down this particular path. And I guess that that's one way that we fight this fake news, which is a manifestation of these super Puritan communities with this highly refined social consensus. Um, I think um, in, in my video that I put out this morning, uh, and it's currently labeled uh, how the Berkeley riots and the Quebec city shooting are related. Um, in my video, I also suggested another another promising avenue is looking at how shaming men and not allowing them their own identity separate from serving society, serving women. So we, we sort of have a situation where there used to be an identity for men. It, there's some contest in the, in the uh, comments what it was specifically called, but there was a word called where, which referred to adult men specifically, whereas man was gender neutral. Now there's some contest whether where man was ever a compound or if it was weapon man, but regardless, this is linguistic f f fine details. Um, I apologize to all linguistic nerds. <laughs> just, just, just accept my apologies. Um, but there used to be a, a name that recognized that masculinity was an, for want of a better way of phrasing, an occupation and an important occupation for someone to have in society. So doing masculine being masculine was important and there was a recognition of that with a term only for men whereas man itself was considered gender neutral now there's a lot more contest over whether or not man is gender neutral but that actually was introduced by the feminists as an entirely other story and so we start with this situation where we've removed that that sense of respect that men deserve their own linguistic category to recognize that being a man being masculine is something that's valuable. And that's been that's been gone since like you know the 13th century. And what has been replaced is this idea of this um uh, the suffix man, which is essentially person who does the prefix. So when you refer to a, a person as a man, that you're essentially saying person who takes his value from the prefix, but he's got no prefix, so he's got no freaking value, unless he's a fireman or or you know a policeman or an X-Men or some something, he's doing something. And I think that really ties into what Warren Farrell said when we look at tragedies. When we look at tragedies, the way that men are humanized in a tragedy is to use their occupation. You don't say a hundred men died in a fire, you say a hundred firemen died in a fire, fighting a fire. That humanizes them. You just use men, nobody cares. But if you, if you, you realize that it's firemen dying, you care because they have a value. Man doesn't. And so you use uh, um, 100 miners trapped in a mine. Miners have a value, or, uh, but men don't. You know, and that's the, that's the kind, and they don't because we don't have a recognition that masculinity is something you do that brings value to the world. And as a result of that, and I think what we're seeing now is sort of a, a, the end game of removing that recognition and that respect for masculinity. And men fighting and trying to serve an ideology to replace the identity that they lost. Um, I don't think we would see the Berkeley riots, and in some ways I don't think we would necessarily see the Quebec City shooting or these kind of mass shootings if there was a respect for doing masculinity, for being masculine, and whatever that takes, because masculinity also is, you know, art, artistic talent, musical talent, those things were considered to be masculine or expressions of masculinity too. It doesn't necessarily have to be getting a broad ax and felling a moose with one blow. You know, it, 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 there was a whole wide range of how you could express masculinity, but there was a recognition that that brought value to society that's gone now. And I think if we brought that back, we would see a lot less of this extreme form of service to an ideology in, in trying to earn a socially positive identity from men. And Karen has been 
unmuting and muting herself, so I'm going to no, let her go. No, I was I was going to add things, and then then you you actually said them. So add them now. Oh wait, wait. You say I said them. Yeah. So you have nothing left to add. I have nothing. I got I nothing. got nothing. Nothing. Shall we shall we cue the codger then? Watch some codger. Yes. Hannah, do you have anything to add before we want to watch some codger? Brian, Brian, paging Brian. Actually, I think you put it pretty well. Well, thank you. I'm glad that I put it well. <laughs> I don't think there's really anything to add. You said the entire thing that needed to be said. Yeah. And regardless of what the particular argu linguistic argument is, there was a word that recognized the value that men brought by giving them a separate category, separate from this gender-neutral suffix, man. And I think we need to somehow get back to that. I don't know if it's going to come through actually going back to old English and, and starting to use uh, where to refer to a man or um, wep weapon man. I don't know. I don't know if that's the answer, but certainly I think, well, I, think I think weapon man sounds pretty cool, but I don't know if it's going to really tone down the whole uh, anti male hysteria. I mean, like, oh my God, look at all these weapon men. Um, <laughs> You know, well, actually, I think it was a reference to the penis uh, and the sword sort of thing. Although that in itself of itself is a little bit hostile to. Well, yeah, I. I mm, okay. But where, where itself actually? I mean, regardless of the contest about whether or not the word "wearman" was a word, where itself was a word that explicitly referred to adult male human, not gender neutral, specifically gendered. So, for example, it would be "wear with and man." together and then we just got rid of where and left man okay so brian codger i don't know if brian's oh, if, if it's, behold it's the new rules of social media they're not actually rules they're just jokes in the format of new rules what B bill who ma that's not a name that's a face noise how well, nobody owns new rules, surely. Oh, bloody hell. All right, behold the fake new rules of social media. Nobody should take this seriously, but everyone should act like they should, like they're being given orders from some, some self-aggrandized hegemony. <laughs> Got that? Fake new rule number one, the backfire effect. This describes the habit of the partisan pea brain not only to reject any and all reasoning or data which contradicts your blasted narrative, but to double down and strengthen one's resolve as a result. It's like trying to pull a golf ball out of your own rectum using only your fingers. You'll find you cannot achieve purchase. You can only push it further in. Social media is known to have the effect of increasing the overall rate of golf ball administration. And, and the number of cooks spoiling the broth, as it were. Fake new rule number two. The effortless purge. Silencing the heathens isn't the chore it used to be. In my day, when a whippersnapper gave us any jip, we'd have to take them out back, string them up with barbed wire, and then shoot them in the throat while praising Baal. Purges used to be vigorous affairs, got the blood up, the digestion moving. But you lazy young gutter snipes, all you have to do is click a mouse. You call that a blood sacrifice? Manipulating the ligaments of some arthritic rodent? I, I, don't, I don't understand the things anymore. Fake new rule number three. Social consensus junk food. When the mob is in charge, crack outsells echinacea. Because mobs are not like individuals, they do not crave any finer things. They crave only what is most addictive. This is why your brightly colored Wendy McBurger plop franchises do better in dense populations. Because that's where you find the weak, tired people spoiled for choice. And it's why social media is a breeding ground for oily, saccharine ideologies that tell you everything you want to hear and nothing you need to hear. You people are pigs. There, I said it. Fake new rule number four. Brighter lights create darker shadows. 
Consensus makes everything seem bright and agreeable and innocent. That is, everything except the heretics who oppose your consensus, who appear in the form of slobbering man-jackals hell-bent on eating your children's children. Sometimes you find it easier to believe such monst monsters are extinct, but other times you find it more convenient to believe there are legions of them at any given time, billowing over your roof like a meandering flock of puffins. It's all by the by, though. Since, you're, since it's all in your imagination, you blocked everyone who looked like they might turn into a puffin. Fake new rule number five. You get lazy. The mind is a system of muscles, and any muscle left unused will atrophy. You may devote all day every day to lifting the, the toe it takes to virtue signal for the bleeding obvious among the exclusive company of those who agree with you, like a chamber of skulls lining the walls all with their jaws wide open for reception. But if you never flex any calories in the pursuit of actually arguing your point, then you're not but a roly-poly blob of flabby brain matter with two working fingers for picking up cheese balls and clicking that bloody mouse. When I was allowed, you had to breathe the same air as the people you cared about, not to sort them with checkboxes like some damnable postal clerk in hell clutching a poppy pipe full of lies. Why, I should box your ears. Thrice, I tell you, I didn't get where I am today by molly-coddling pollywogs in some insipid soup of mediocre standards. And furthermore, I wouldn't flummox you if you were two gobstoppers who were bamboozle. Thrice, I say. Okay, thank you, Codger, for those uh, cognizant thoughts on that the matter. The wonderful analogies, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, um, I just want to say he, he sounded like he was speaking from experience about the whole golf ball thing, but Roger uh, has a lot of experience. Um, but, uh, I will say forceps, you know, or, uh, you know, those sort of, uh, hot dog tongs for barbecues. Those probably work for you, Codger. That sounds painful. So, so what you're saying is you use a piece of some forceps to get the golf ball from the buns, eh? Yeah, well, they have to be like the kind of forceps that you use to deliver a baby. Okay. Right? Or, or the, um, not, not, the, not the, the, the tongs with teeth, but the tongs that, you know, sort of are like circles on the ends of, you know, they're just made out of wire and wire circles on the ends of sticks that, you know, you'd be able to kind of really squeeze in there and just, like, grasp the... Okay. Guess it really depends on what you're into. <laughs> yeah. oh. Oh. Hey, oh, come on, you guys. You knew I had to go there, right? Yes. I once read a post. Uh, it, was, it was an entry on... Um, there's a guy... Oh, fuck. What was his name? Cecil Adams does uh, a thing called the straight dope, and I had this huge huge edition of one of his you know gatherings of all of these facts like why do trees for a week downtown in san francisco smell like sperm and um yeah he uh there there was a there was an entry on uh, is is hamster stuffing real or is it an urban legend and and he said he couldn't find he did a major investigation couldn't find any evidence of any reports of hamster stuffing that he could verify but he listed uh, a huge, huge list of things that have come out of people's anuses while in the hospital um, because they accidentally put something in their anus that they shouldn't, including a toolbox, light bulbs, um, uh, sewing needles. Um, yeah, yeah, but all those people were actually doing things that you normally do clothed, naked, and they slipped and fell on the object. That's their story, and they're sticking okay, to it. Right. Right. Yeah, that's, okay. that's, you know. <laughs> can, can I just get in here, you know, just slip into this, make, make an opening here for me? Sewing needles? What the yeah. fuck is the... Yeah. What sewing needles. Has anyone, what would possess anyone to look at a sewing needle? Has anyone ever, I mean, you guys must have experienced the sewing needle in the foot after you've dropped it on the floor, or maybe only I am that stupid. No, 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 oh, I, no I, I, it's happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've actually been sewing with a sewing machine and put the sewing needle through you my sewed your fingers, fingers together. All the way, oh. all the way. Oh. 
I sewed my fingers together. I'm not good uh, at sewing machines. What logic? It was what, an what accident. Logic? It goes so no, 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 I know, I understand that. that in your butt is what she said. Yeah, what logic? What possible? Oh, what, was the, what was the collection of things? It was, it was like uh, 36 of something, but 35 of them all came from the same patient during different visits Must to the hospital. Must have been toolbox well, and guy. Here's the thing. It's, it, it's possible that the item was swallowed and, and managed to work its way through the, the, the numerous feet of intestine you have and just get stuck in, in, in a colon. That happens too sometimes. Um, although more often than not when people, there are people that swallow the most bizarre things and sewing needles and razor blades are among the bizarre things that people have swallowed. Uh, people do some very, very odd things that, that, that they end up in the emergency room after they've done them. Um, it's, it's, you, you get some bizarre stories when, when you uh, are close to somebody who has worked in an emergency room anywhere actually because um, because my ex that worked in an ER worked in a in a smaller city uh, ER and and had all kinds of strange swallowed things and stuff up the butt stories okay well you know stuff I think you don't want to know <laughs> I, I think there's a there's sort of a, an, a there's sort of a limit how much of the we can talk well maybe there isn't a limit maybe this is just a limit to how much I can tolerate um, before I want to end it, uh, <laughs> just I just think I end it. Go on for quite can, some time longer. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Can, can we tolerate this one thing that is completely off the topic of things up the butt, sort of? Yes, we can. We okay. can. We can. I, I want everybody to be up Trump's butt over one thing. Before he left office, Obama passed, or actually made an executive order, if I recall correctly, that actually was a huge attack on freedom of the press and he used fake news as an excuse to do it um, that that order set the stage for federal control of of freedom of the press and it it had to do with re-educating reporters and stuff like that that needs to go neither side should have that regardless of, of what you believe about politics, regardless of what you believe about fake news, freedom of the press, even if the press lies, because we are the fact checkers, freedom of the press is paramount to, to a free society. Without it, we don't have the ability to, to publish widespread criticism when the government does something wrong. And as much as I did not want Hillary Clinton in office, I don't want anyone in office to have any kind of get out of criticism free card, especially not against the press. All right. PSA announcement from Hannah. Okay, so uh, we are actually in a discussion whether or not to do two items for the after show for the patrons. One is discussing... The, the new direction that Hannah Barbera is taking with Snagglepuss, <laughs> which apparently he they're they're thinking of turning Snagglepuss into, I believe, a gay gothic playwright. They're gonna snaggle him by the pussy. <laughs> um, okay, but but um, wh what if you don't actually know anything about Snagglepuss? Um, it's still hilarious if, if he's the pink. Panther, but not the Pink Panther. Heavens um, to Murgatroyd! <laughs> I, I know, I know. It's not character. that much of a stretch. Uh, you know, and, and I actually wouldn't mind reading it if it was done in the the style of uh, crack fic. You know, classic. Uh, what it, the fuck? Is well, this would be a fun if role. Like that, if it was like that really campy movie, um, I think it was like in the 80s, it starred, I think, uh, Lauren Hutton and George Hamilton, was called Zorro the Gay Blade. <laughs> and and it, was, it was essentially Zorro got injured or laid up or something, and he couldn't do his job rescuing the ladies and leaving his letter Z everywhere. So his twin brother, Ramon, um, who happens to be gay, took over for a while, and many funny hijinks and uh, delightful colored Zorro costumes 
ensued. Um, oh, so. somebody asked in the chat. Notice how they never say how much money you have to give in to get into the or order to get in the after show. After show well, after show. Um, to be able to watch the after show, all you have to do is like I don't know, throw a buck a month, a month. Um, um, to actually get after into it. And Karen, you're echoing, yeah. To actually get into it, <laughs> the after show. <laughs> oh God. Oh God. <laughs> to get into the butt. Yeah, to get the, the, the of the show. The badger butt. Yeah, to get into the badger butt, <laughs> you have to you have to pledge seven uh seven and a half dollars per episode for um I think six episodes. Uh and then you're and then you're in the badger butt. Um and we just do that because we only have like five slots. Um, and yeah, so if, if you want to do that, you can go to www.patreon.com. What was the other item that we were thinking? Oh, slash Honey Badger Radio. www.patreon.com slash Honey Badger Radio. What was the other item that we were thinking of talking about, Karen? Was it the South was Park it? thing? Yeah, it was the South Park thing. Where, South Park where banning. They've, they've pointed out that they're going to, uh, they're not going to um, parody Trump the way they had been because politics, American politics has now become a parody of itself and it's kind and of it's hard to go hard. any farther than it has already gone. And with, uh, with what just happened at Berkeley and with, you know, as fast as Trump is, is keeping his campaign promises and everything, I think they, they do have a point there. Um, and it, it has, we have become, we've hit parody level in our politics again, um, this isn't the first time, and it probably won't be the last time. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. All uh, right. Yeah. Okay. So Brian, heads up. We're going to go into the to the end here. There is a question um, that was asked in chat, though, that needs answered. Um, no, there was never an overt statement in in the past that Snagglepuss was gay. This is, uh, although. You can treat you him can that way. You can look at him that way. The behavior. Karen, you're echoing. Karen, Karen, you're pulling a J.K. Karen, you're Karen, big gay you're Dumbledore's old. big gay academy. No, Karen, uh, the, why the, is your? Why are you suddenly echoing all the time? Because she now? keeps unmuting in the middle of when no, I'm no, talking. I know, but she there was, was never a. There is never a clear statement. It was always left up to uh, the public to decide that for themselves. Really, about characters, what they, what their lives were off screen in cartoons, because they were cartoon characters. They're not real people. They're not. You know, they're not something that so 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 it was just and it was a kids thing. It was created for kids and it was made in such a way that adults could enjoy watching cartoons with their kids and they could put them at the beginning of movies and it could be G rated and stuff like that. So there wasn't they didn't talk about sex, you know, and, and they didn't really show a whole lot about relationships other than friend relationships and that particular uh you know and in, in that particular genre of cartoons, uh, and and yeah, Atrix Wolf says Snagglepuss was not was meant to be foppish, not gay. Well, here's the thing, that's what makes this a, 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 an annoying thing. Even though there's nothing wrong with calling him gay now, even though it's an interesting part for him to play, it the fact that it's being done for political reasons instead of shits and giggles ruins it. Yeah. Okay. Well, but also, let's, let's, also, 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 doesn't taking a character that fits the foppish, flamboyant stereotype that you know everybody's saying, well, not all gay men are lispy, not all okay. gay men are wristy, not all <laughs> gay men dress flamboyantly, not all gay men are obsessed with their attractiveness and talk like you know. Okay, um, Karen. Okay, Karen. What? Why would you pick? A character that fits every gay stereotype and say, oh yeah, no, he's gay. Okay, Karen? All right, we're, we're moving out here. So shh. Everyone shh. Quiet. Just be still. All right. I'm gonna, in, in light of uh, what, I, what I've uploaded in the, uh, on uh, Honey Badge Radio in the morning of today, and again, that's um, how the Quebec City shooting is like the Berkeley Right or the connection between the two, uh, I'm proposing to change and and 
when I say this in the comments, please give me some feedback on this. I'm thinking of changing our approach here at Honey Badge Radio. For a long time, we've focused on anti-feminism, and I still think it's important to call the, out that dogmatic, malignant suicide, uh, pseudoscience, particularly since its constant shaming of men is culpable for creating the situation with, that we're dealing with now, at least part of it, out of control narratives, out of control in part because of the hunger for men to combat shame through service. The solution is not to make feminists or make fun of feminists or argue against them, in my opinion. Not that these are bad things, but let's face it, there's a cottage industry of YouTube channels taking the piss out of feminists. That work is covered many times over. I think the solution is to heal the wound of shame inflicted on men. And this isn't something men can necessarily do for themselves because it was women that inflicted the wound. I think it has to be women who heal it. And in healing it, women can heal their own shame. Because while men have been shamed for being men, women have been shamed for being human. Whenever a feminist tells a woman that recognizing the consequences of her actions, her ability to hurt men, her responsibility to men or society is eternalized misogyny or Stockholm syndrome or being a handmaiden of the patriarchy, whenever feminists shame a woman's own recognition of her full humanity, of her eyes and arms and legs and actions, they shame her personhood. They shame her strength. They shame her intelligence. They shame her will. And they shape her into nothing more than a political tool. We women can fix the shaming wound feminist men dealt men. And in doing that, we can fix our own wounding. And if that sounds like something you want to support, www.patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio. Give a few shekels to put this plan into motion. Thank you.